Hi, folks. Steve Urban here, host of the RouterFlex podcast and founder and CEO of our day job, recruiting firm RouterFlex. We hope you enjoy this episode. And as a reminder, please subscribe to the podcast for updates and news. If you haven't already, check out the series of books we've published on hiring, interviewing, and overall career advice titled The Writer Flex Guide. And finally, today's episode is brought to you by Class 6 Partners. Are you ready to sell your business or raise capital? Class 6 Partners guides you through the entire process, from business optimization to securing the perfect deal. With over $3 billion in transactions, they turn your business dreams into reality. Visit class6partners.com to start your journey today. <laughs> it is true. My, yeah. I think every entrepreneur has a narrative, and that narrative in their head makes them the hero, or they're always tripping along and messing up, and, and that's what I feel 99% of the time. So let's have some fun. Oh, you know what? Let's just keep rolling. Let's see. You know what? Let's just roll right into that as we're talking. Okay. Yeah. Let's just keep going. We're already taping live now. So you're right, uh, Byron. Entrepreneurs. Yeah. They, 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 they only want to talk on social media. They only want to post about, you know, most of the time, not, not all the time, but it's like, Hey, look, look, look at this exit I had, you know, um, a lot of them, they, uh, they, they want to forget about the the struggles or the scars or the failures and so forth. Some people talk about it, but, um, and the, and the reality is most of them, most of us as entrepreneurs have, have failed in something. I mean, it's rare to just start one company, have a big exit and be a millionaire. I mean that it happens, but that's, that is not the norm. <laughs> right. I mean, for me, I, I I uh, think I fail about uh, five times for every, maybe maybe six or seven times for every success I have, and uh, and I'm I kind of came to peace with that. Like that is yeah uh, right. So I mean, so here's how I I think about it. I mean, like uh, actually, I would start over. Not, not not this whole thing, but I would just start over by saying I think the terminology I failed is um is misplaced mm. i think of it as that idea failed or that business failed or that product failed because yeah. if you internalize it and you say i failed uh it's not a lot you can do with that but the flip side is true that when it finally works mm. it keeps you grounded because you didn't succeed either you didn't fail and you didn't succeed the product failed and the product succeeded and i think entrepreneurs at least the ones i know <laughs> uh fail a lot more than they uh, succeed. And I think that's because of a very simple principle, which is good ideas and bad ideas look a lot alike bef on, on the on the beforehand. Let me give you a, a real world example. Okay. I uh, had a website, got a lot of traffic. And then I, uh, the dot com bomb, bomb happened and I lost all my advertisers, right? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden uh, I was like, oh my gosh, nobody's buying my ads. So I guess I better buy my own ads. I better start businesses, buy my own ads and sell my own stuff. Right. <laughs> so I got all these ideas and I said, okay, okay, let's try this. Let's try this. Let's try this. So I come in one morning and I say, Hey, I got two ideas I want to do. Okay. Here's the first singing telegrams delivered over the telephone. It's a website you go to and it's 10 bucks and you can listen to a jingle. And then you put the friend's uh, phone number in and then on their birthday it calls and says, happy birthday, Steve, you're 44 years old. And all that. And I said, people spend $5 on a Hallmark card. They'll spend $10 on a live person calling you and giving you a single telegram. Yeah. So then I had a second idea the same day. I said, okay, when I was a kid, every year, my parents um, would, at Christmas time, they'd give me a letter from Santa Claus. It, it, I would find it. I didn't know it was from them. And then I read that North Pole, Alaska is a place and you can ship mail up there and they'll mail it. They'll drop it in the mail stream and it'll get postmarked North Pole, Alaska. So I said to the team, let's do all of those. Let's do both of these. So we did them both. And the first one, CD Telegrams, over the telephone, it sold zero. And I mean literally zero. No, no pity order. No, my mother didn't order one. Nobody, zero order. I kept saying, well, the site's broken. Like, and you know, we had hired singers, we had hired songwriters, we had done it all. I mean, it was beautiful, right? Uh, and then we launched the other one and it 
uh, it just, you know, got, it just took off. And I what, saw. And what was that? What was the other one? The letters from Santa mailed from the North. Oh, oh, oh. okay. And I have sold over $10 million worth of those letters now. I still sell those letters. Uh, really? Have, have, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I still have that business, santamail.org. And uh, I've sold well over $10 million worth. There's a Santa was here kit now, and there's a postcard he mails after Christmas. And there for a while, I was I had rented a warehouse, a refrigerated warehouse, and I was making snow. And I was going to send people snow to arrive on Christmas. Like, this took <laughs> off and it became this big thing. Now, the point yeah. of the story, the point of the story yeah. is, I thought those were both good ideas, but it turns out one was a really bad idea. But you wouldn't know that. You, I could not have known that. So wow. that was when I kind of got this epiphany um, <laughs> that I wasn't going to be able to tell the difference between good ideas and bad ideas unless I yeah. them. So I read a quote. It was, enlightened trial and error outperforms the reasoning of a flawless intellect. Enlightened trial and error outperforms the reasoning of a flawless intellect. And I don't even have a flawless intellect. I have a flawed intellect. So I said, I'm going to do enlightened trial and error. And so the way I get around this, I, I fail all the time, is I try to make my failures cost as little as possible and make my successes pay as much as possible. <laughs> and that's how come, that's how come I have failure after failure after failure after failure after failure. And then one thing works and it, I guess it sounds like a, a venture fund almost. <laughs> it's, it's a portfolio of you. Uh, um, but are, I are you... ended up starting 50 or 60 Small businesses. Uh, wow. wow. I sold um, $20 million worth of Italian charm braces. I sold $3 million worth of family coat of arms things. And then 57 products, I sold nothing. Uh, and so that's how I made it work for me. Your tax, um, account, your tax account loves you. <laughs> and then I also learned something. <laughs> um, something I kind of just gleaned over the years. Now, I was in high school debate for four years. And then I you went to high school to, in Texas. I'm, I'm guessing you're from Texas, aren't you? I am. I grew up yeah. on a farm in East Texas. East Texas. Little, where, where, whereabouts? A little town called, well, actually, it was a little town outside. Uh, the, the, the town was Tyler, but we didn't actually live in Tyler. It was okay. this town of 500 people called Bullard, but we didn't even live there. We live way out <laughs> past town. So, anyway, okay. anyway, right. um, I had four years of high school debate. And the way that works is you uh, you argue for something against it, for something against it, for something against it. Then I went to college and uh, the went to university. Rice. I went did. To Rice. And believe it or not, they didn't have a debate program. So I co-founded it with some people. And I had four more years of debate. And what that? I learned about debate cool. Cool. is that good debaters win, regardless of what side they're arguing, right? They argue for it and they'll win and they argue against it. And win. Now, this is a real problem for an entrepreneur because... In our kind of society, let's say you're the CEO and, you know, Bob thinks we should do X and Julie thinks we should do Y. And so you have a meeting and Bob says, here's why we should do X. And Amy says, here's why we should do Y. And then you go, hmm, well, I think whichever one made better arguments. But all you have done is just judged a debate tournament. There has no bearing whatsoever on who is right or what you should do or anything. Great point. Great All you've point. done is identified who is a better debater. Now, if you had told them to switch sides and argue the other one, you wow. probably would have stuck with the same person because they probably would have won again. Great way to look um, at it. And so what you've got to do is not trust eloquent people who had eight years of debate. <laughs> I could take any side and try to convince you. Uh, you've got so to, good. in your mind, always be, um, always be listening for the people who aren't as eloquent. And I that like brought me to another truth, which was not to believe everything I think, because even when I think something, even when I hear it, and even when I think I'm balancing all the evidence, and even when I think, I'm, and I'm like, that's what I should do, I'm still almost always wrong, because <laughs> oh, I, man. yeah. So, where'd you get the Where'd you get the entrepreneurial blood? Where'd that come from? Was were your parents entrepreneur? Like, what? How'd that even happen? Well, I don't know. No, I mean, I grew up in a leave it to beaver kind of house. All right. My mom stayed home with us. My dad had one job in corporate America, same job, 33 years. Oh, okay. Life. Wow. And um, wow. and then uh, my first big success was actually, uh, I was very young, relatively young, and I bought a can of spray paint and I bought um, a set of stencils and I walked around my neighborhood. 
And I said, I had my patter down. I was like, you know, nobody, an ambulance or a fire truck couldn't tell. What uh, number? The house number. Right. So five bucks. I got the paint. I got the stencil. That's the thing about it. Once you own your paint and your stencil, it's all profit. And I could go out in an afternoon and I made bank. I mean, I made real How money that? for a 12 year old. Right. Well, like, you I mean, the, I, yeah. You had I the entrepreneurial, it. you had the entrepreneurial bug it's early. Right. Yeah, so I think maybe I was like, man, this is a way to go. Uh, I'll try it again. And then I did 27 other things that didn't work. So um, wow. what's your biggest, what's your Super Bowl uh, exit so far? Oh, you've probably had a couple, but what's your, what are the, what are the big ones for you? To my knowledge, none of my investors, I don't believe any investor in any of my companies and I've raised money six or I've raised money for six or seven different companies, probably 20, 25 times. I mean, a lot. Okay. okay. And as far as I can remember, no one's lost any money in any of my companies. Really? Yeah, I know. I know. That's but pretty good. That, that comes at a great price. It comes at a great price because as, as all of you, as all your listeners know, you kind of have two choices. You can, you can go kind of the venture route where institutional people are, or you can go the, the, the angel route, and, mm -hmm. which is what I did a lot of the time. And and it's very different. It's very different. The motivations of the people are different. Right. All right. of it. The thing about it is, since most of mine were angel investments, uh, they were all people I knew and they were friends of mine. And what you yeah. realize is they're not investing in your company. They're investing in you. And you can't ever walk away from that. I and, and so I ran myself ragged. When I would have successes, they would take seven or eight years and it was like failure after failure after failure after failure but it was like the um revolutionary war you know we lost every battle but the last one and that's what matters right <laughs> um and so uh i just i have I, I do think if i have a virtue it is uh tenacity i just stay with it and okay just keep going at it it sounds like now, you've always... that doesn't mean that doesn't mean I don't give up on bad. I'm like, man, that was a stinker of an idea. I'm not going to sing telegrams. That was horrible. But in terms of the, the entity itself and its ability to create, uh, I couldn't. And so I always had to see them through at least to break even or to, or to exit. When did uh, when did you say I want to write a book? And when was your first book? And what made you decide to be an author? <clears throat> when you, I did. I was part of a big IPO, a two billion dollar IPO. And I built and designed the core technology that it was based on. So you can when that so you cashed out. You 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 bet you made that's where you made some bank. No, I mean yes, but that not the point of the story. Oh I mean I was there, rang the bell, I, I was there on the, the cool. dais. Yeah, rang right. the bell and was, all that stuff. What happens is you start getting invitations to speak. I see. And I didn't know something. I didn't know that good speakers give the same speech over and over. I didn't know that. I really didn't know that. And so every time I got an invitation, I would write a new speech, a completely new speech. I'd be like, who are these people? Why are they there? What are they worried about? What do they care about? And I would I would write a lot of talks, a lot of them. And then after a while, I was like, wow, there are, there are common themes here. And so um, I said, I think this is a book. So I put it all together and uh, self-published it and sold 11,000 copies in hardback. I sold 11. I mean, like I sold every one of those because every time I gave a speech, it was like, would you buy 200 books? Would you buy 200 books? <laughs> after I, after you sell 10,000 books on your own, uh, with that, you can go to a publisher and they'll give you a book deal. Publishers are less interested in what your book is about and much more interested in your platform. So I started writing a lot of books and uh, my, you know, I ended up being published with Brandon and Schuster and Random House and um and then uh and, and so forth and, how many books uh, how, how many books have you have you written six i six no, no they all I, I mean let me rephrase that i have written many more than that i've published six um <laughs> and uh six and, and i'm in 13 languages and um sold about half a million copies my book on ai which i wrote way back still sells more copies every day than all my other books put together. Which one is um, that? It's called The Fourth Age. And it's about AI. It's a philosophy I'm looking at, book. I'm looking at, I'm looking at it right now on Amazon, The it's Fourth Age. It's a philosophy age. book about AI. I'm not supposed to say that because that evidently does not supercharge sales. But 
Uh, it is a philosophy book. It doesn't have any technology in it, but so it's a timeless book. It's like, just, what are people and what are machines and how are people and machines similar and how are they different? Really great what, ratings, by the way. 354 reviews. The Fourth Age, Smart Robots, Conscious Computers, and the Future of Humanity. Yes. By Byron Reese. All right. Very good. Okay. Wow. I got. I, I need to read that. Is that on audio too? Did you do audio on these? They all have audio. Oddly, none of my publishers would let me read it. Uh, I have decided henceforth I'm going to self-publish. Okay. My next book, my seventh book, I'm going to go back to that for two reasons. One, I can't find a publisher that when I turn in a book, uh, they can get it out in less than a year. Less than a year. What are, I mean, I'm like, are you planting why, acorns? Why? And like, why? Well, I, mean, I don't. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Well, you know, it's the hottest business model of the 19th century, and and they still, I think, as a general rule, act that way. And I want to read my own books. I want to write them, and I want to publish them within three months because they do have to be edited, they do have to be proofed, they do have to be fact checked, and all of that. But I write very quickly. I only write two hours a day, uh, six a.m. to eight a.m. every morning, five days a week. And I did that because. Um, I have a, a wife and uh, we, we have four children and we homeschool them. And when they were little, those were the only hours I had in an room. <laughs> What's the latest book? I know. So the I one know. that just came out yeah. is uh, my Shea Devra. It my, my, I think my life work in a way. So I started writing it on March the 1st, okay. 2022. Okay. It was the day I put my father in a nursery. Oh, and I right. finished writing it September 1st, 2022, the day he died. Six months. Um, and in that six months, he did not go gentle into the night. He raged against the dying of the light. It was a really rough time in terms of everything going on in my mind, going back and forth and getting kicked out of nursing home, all this stuff going on. And somehow I wrote that book that I'm so proud of. I'm so proud of this book. And so it's called We Are Agora. And here's 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 the setup. <clears throat> Actually, may I tell a short story before I absolutely and by, and by the way, for the listeners, just we are Agora. But go ahead. Yep. I was I grew up on a farm and I was a Boy Scout. And then when you're a Boy Scout, you go to Boy Scout camp. And when you go to Boy Scout camp, you take merit badge classes. And all the merit badges are like woodcraft, canoeing, and not tying and all of that. But I was a nerd. I know, implausible, can't believe that, but I was a real nerd. And there were never nerdy merit badges, like what I wanted. But then one year I went and there was a new merit badge that they were offering called bookkeeping. And I was so much of a nerd, I thought, you know, I want to spend my summer learning accounting. That sounds like a great thing for a Boy Scout to do. Really so I show yeah. up to the bookkeeping merit badge and this old grizzled man comes out, me and six other kids who also wanted to learn accounting. And he said there was no such thing as a bookkeeping merit badge. The Boy Scouts of America would never offer a bookkeeping merit badge. That it was a misprint, and I had signed up for beekeeping. <laughs> and that's the story about how I became a beekeeper. So I, I, I fell in love with it. And, and I, so I, when I left Boy Scout camp, I bought a beehive. Are you and still a beekeeper? Do you still have bees? At the moment, I don't. Because my children okay. right. uh, were not fans. But... Um, <laughs> you got so, you got you got all kinds of little interesting things behind the curtain, Byron. You, oh, got, all kind, you got all kinds of little 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 nuggets in here. <laughs> so, as I was watching these bees, uh, I learned something. I learned something that a beehive is a super organism. Now, what that means is, you know, there are cells, and cells come together and they make bees, and bees are animals. But what people may not realize is that a bunch of bees come together, form a hive, and that hive is a different animal. Now, that may just sound like a cute metaphor or something, but it isn't. That hive, uh, first of all, is a warm-blooded animal. It holds its body temperature to 97 degrees, whereas a bee is cold-blooded. That hive, that animal, has a, has a lifespan, maybe a century, whereas a bee only lives a few weeks. That hive has a memory that transcends any bee, and most importantly, that Hive can do things that no bee can do. It can I did not know that. Home. Did not know it that. Can do. There's a, even a tradition that wow. is called the telling of the bees, that when the beekeeper dies, somebody has to go out and tell the bees, like, hey, the beekeeper died. And as I understand it, don't hold me to this, when Queen Elizabeth passed, they went and told the royal bees that she had passed. 
Uh, because the, the the thinking is if you don't tell the bees, the beekeepers gone, uh, they leave because they're like, eh, I don't know about this place. Uh, so here's my question. Here was my, as I sit there watching these bees, I'm thinking, I'm like, if cells make bees and bees make hives and a hive is an animal, is there a corollary for people? We're made up of cells. We come together and make people. But do a group of people come together and form an animal, an actual living, thinking, breathing, reasoning, conscious animal? You wouldn't know it because it would live on a different time scale than we do. We would be mere cells in it. And so I was like, hmm, I wonder if that's possible. And then I thought, is it possible to know the answer to that? And so uh, I consider myself a science writer. That's what I do. So I constructed a series of hypotheses. I said, well, if we are a superorganism, what would be true? Well, the first thing that would be true is that humanity would be able to do things that no human can do. And that's true. Um, billions of things. You know, no no um, human being can make an iPhone, right? There's not a soul in the world who could do that. Now, there was an essay called I Pencil. Like, there was nobody who could even make a pencil. Uh, but yet pencils and iPhones get made. The second thing that would happen, so emergent properties would be demonstrated. Second thing that would be true is that people could not survive outside of the superorganism. If you take a bee out and put it in your car and drive a couple of miles and let it go, eh, the bee's not going home. Like that bee's going to die because yeah. it can't, it's so specialized, it can't survive outside of that. So the, the question was, are people? So I wrote an entire book asking myself, is it possible that there's this creature, which I named Agora? I didn't know what I thought when I started writing the book. Almost all of my books I write about things I don't know anything about because it's honestly, like, that's my journey. It's things I'm interested in. And that's why, you know, in our chat beforehand, I said, I'm writing a book about ghosts right now and magic and fairies and all of that stuff. I'm writing a science book about those things. Uh, is it, and, isn't Agora, uh, what the, what's the Latin word or Greek or Roman word? Oh, or whatever? You, yes, yes. I should have done that agora is a greek word and it's, it was a marketplace in ancient in an ancient greek city and yeah. the idea is all the people come there they're arguing they're buying selling trading ideas doing stuff doing commerce and that's us that's us that's us on a grand scale so yeah. i love i'm so proud of the agora book um i mean it's sold like oh i don't know at least a dozen copies by now but um i, I I'm joking to say it, it is not selling at all. I mean, it's these singing telegrams <laughs> of books delivered over the telephone, and Fourth Age was the Santa uh, Mail one. Yeah, but how long has it? How long has it been out? Well, books—that's a great question, actually. Uh, on a, a, a real author, like somebody whose name you you know, they they launch a book and it spikes day one and then it drops off. You know, I'm nobody from nowhere. So I launched my books, and they all do have to build. Fourth Age is still rising in sales after ten years. The sales oh, are that still was, going oh, up. you wrote that. You wrote that book ten years ago, that AI book, the AI robe, the Fourth Age. Wow. Uh -huh. Eight or ten. Wow. When are you writing your next AI book? And I want to get into that. By the well, way, well, I have uh, two ideas for that. Uh, the first one is uh, I should write it. <clears throat> I've I have been approached by a publisher to write it, and I could either rev what I have or write something new. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, we're in this world where... Uh, yeah, this world. Yeah. Let's, yeah, yeah. Let's, I mean, yeah. here, I and I also hold some contra contrarian views. So there was a time I ran a, 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 a research company called GigaOM, and there I, I was, I covered the AI beat. And I wrote a lot about AI. And I started a podcast called Voices in AI. And I had 120 guests. Really? And then can, you were, still, can you still find it on YouTube or anything? Can yeah, you? it is amazing. It is the most boring podcast you will listen to. Because <laughs> what it is, I was inspired by the Lincoln-Douglas debates where, aware of the moment they were in, they decided to have a, a, a series of debates that would transcend that moment. And, and you could read them now. And they still... And I said, that's what I want to do. I want to find all the people who've been there since the beginning. Oh, and I, I want to know their thoughts right now when it's all still nascent. And the cool thing about AI, to, uh, when I started this podcast, probably eight or nine years ago, uh, was they were all available. <laughs> they, did, they you were interview, all... did you interview people like Ray Kurzweil or anybody like uh -huh. anybody? Yeah, and um, even um, 
the guy who won the Nobel Prize yesterday. Seriously, and, uh, really? I had, wow. I had yeah. Andrew, Andrew wow. Lee, uh, Kaitu Lee, um, wow. Bob Metcalf, and did it either. Uh, Stephen Wolfram was on it twice. Um, how come we didn't? How come we're not doing that now? Uh, Jeff Dean, AI person at Google, employee number thirty, I think. Uh, I mean, I got the most amazing people, and so when I had him on the phone, I was like, "Talk to me for an hour." Tell me what you think. And so that's why I said it's really boring because it is a long, slow, methodical conversation about artificial well, intelligence. Well, the, and, guy, uh, the, guy, the, the, the godfather of AI, he's the one that just won the Nobel. Yeah. I mean, his name's escaping me. Uh, Nick, is, Nick. Huh? H-I-N-T-O-N? Are you thinking Nick Buster? No. Oh, no. no, he gosh. was on my show. Anyway, uh, anyway, all these folks were on my show. And I would all start off. By asking them two questions. Let me ask them to you real quickly. Uh, I've never done this before, by the way. Um, do you do you believe we're... Well, no, I, I, my first thing is, what is artificial intelligence? That's, okay. that's where you start with everything. And it's a problematic term because it's unclear right. what we mean by artificial. Yeah, I agree. Is it artificial because, is it artificial because we made it? Like, um, you know, artificial whatever, snow. Sweetener. It's snow. Right. Or is it artificial because it's fake? Like artificial turf, is it really grass? Artificial fruit, is it really fruit? And then you get to the word intelligence, and there's even less consensus on it. So I would ask that question, what is that? <laughs> then I would say, do you believe we're going to make general intelligence? And, and you know the difference between those two things. Yep. General intelligence, what you see in the movies, it's an AI that's versatile and can learn. Um, narrow AI is 99.9% .9 of everything we invest in. That's uh, get a lot of data about the past, look for patterns in it, make projections. That's what chat GPT is, for instance. It's mm -hmm. just narrow AI. It's pattern recognition and prediction. Although it's although it's moving closer to AGI. It's getting close. But anyway, so, go ahead. <laughs> um, so uh, I will ask you, do you think uh, we're going to make AGI? Yes, do I think we will? Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay. I mean, that's my current. And I, would then predict, the third question, I would predict yes. Yeah, my current prediction. And then yes. the third question is, well, when do you think we'll get it? And I uh, how about next month? <laughs> and the answers I got now, granted, seven years ago, yeah, were between five and five hundred years. Those were my answers. And so you have to say, wow, that's that's really strange, because you know, seven, if I said, when are we going to get seven to years Mars? later, we're almost here. Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. When if I were to ask you, like, well, when are we going to get to Mars? Some people might say ten years. Some might say twenty. Might some might say fifty. But nobody's going to say 500. So it's like, well, what's going on there? Why is it? And it's because nobody, everybody agrees nobody knows how to make it. We just, and so I say, well, why do you believe we can make it then? So what's your answer to that? Uh, I, why do I believe we can make it to Mars? Or why do I believe? No, no, that we can create AGI. Why do I believe? Um, I guess I believe it because it feels like we're almost already there. I mean, it's... It almost feels like we're already there. And I guess the speed of the advancements that I've seen from like, you know, let's call it from GPT-2 to GPT-4. I mean, that mm -hmm. that leap was so incredible that, um, I, I yeah, I guess the, so, the, short, the short answer, the short answer would be the very first day that I used chat GPT-4, my mind was blown. I was like, holy shit. I think we just entered into a whole new... <laughs> <laughs> a whole new world. Yeah. <laughs> um, now you can't yeah. even air this. I just like. Yeah. In any case, so of my 120 guests that I asked this question to, guess how many said they do not believe AGI is possible? Well, this was seven years ago. See, so I think it was, it was different. See, it, no, it, no, but impossible is a big word. Like okay, time that's travel true. is. Oh, impossible. true, 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 true. Going back true. in time, you might say that's impossible. And then yeah, how many I'm gonna guess ninety percent. I'm gonna guess ninety percent said it was impossible. No, only four people said impossible. Oh, and here and so when you ask the hundred and sixteen, well, why do you believe it if we don't know how to make it? They all said the same exact thing. They said, "Look, we know we can make machines with general intelligence because we are machines with general intelligence." And and then you know they would do this whole thing like if I if I took every cell in your body and every neuron and I copied it down to the other and then I put all that together, it would be you. And I don't believe. Almost anything of what you just said, by the way, about chat, and I don't believe AGI is possible. It's impossible. I, I'm, I'm, I guess nobody knows. Knows. But nobody I guess it, knows. I guess it depends on the real definition, right? What is your definition of AGI? Well, let me let me put it. Well, it would be a machine that can duplicate or exceed 
um, the uh, abilities of the human in kind of any any intellectual realm. It can learn new things and teach itself new things. You know, I mean, don't ask ChatGPT who you should marry. Don't ask it what career you should have. Don't ask it to drive your car. Don't ask it uh, when your kids should come home at night. Don't ask it anything useful. Like because it does this tiny, 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 tiny narrow thing of like, uh, what are three ideas for uh, the eclipse party? Everybody guy goes crazy. I love it. Don't get me wrong. I use it. I think it is a technology five billion years in the making, and I'll I'll come back to that. But actually, I'm gonna let me let me say that part first, and then I'll talk about why I think ADI is impossible. So, um, I wrote some an people, article. Some people think we're already there, but go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I wrote an article called The Four Billion Year History of Chat GPT. Okay. And here's how it goes. When life formed on Earth, and for three and a half billion years, it was all single cell, there was only one place in the known universe that we could store data. And that was DNA, right? That was the right. only place you could write data. And it takes like 10,000 years to write a new piece of data. Uh, but it, it's very reliable, it copies itself quite efficiently. And, and the, But the only way it improves is by random chance. So three and a half billion years, nothing really changed. And why would it? It's, everything's kind of locked down. Then 500 million years ago, you have the Cambrian and, and, and brains evolved. And all of a sudden, there's a second place to write data. You can write it in your DNA. There's 600 meg of data in your DNA right now. 600 meg. Um, but then you can write it in your brain. And the thing about brains is you can read and write from them like that through a process called learning. You can learn new things. Now, think about this for a second. <clears throat> if, if there was a purple berry that was poisonous, and this is, and, and let's say we don't have brains, eventually, maybe in a million years, animals would evolve a distrust of it, and they wouldn't eat it. Maybe there's a few animals that just don't like purple. And so they don't ever eat it. And then their dreams go. Okay. Now, if I say to you, hey, man, don't eat the purple berries. Now, think about that. I took me 30 seconds. And, and that was 100,000 years of evolution for you. If you had to evolve that knowledge, that would have taken you 100,000 years. But you didn't. I just said, don't eat the purple berries. And you were like, okay, I just wrote that to my genome. That is now part of your genome. Don't eat purple berries. Part of your genome. But you learned it in 30 seconds. And that's why humans evolve. That's why we had this. And dolphins don't. Like as smart as you think dolphins are, they don't, they don't have this world we're in. And that's because every 30 seconds we evolve a million years. Because we we learn, and those are our mutations, not this random stuff. Okay. Now, however, that's not quite as good as it sounds because people have a problem, and that is that they die. And when you die, 99% of everything you know is going to die with you. And maybe you taught some people some stuff, but that's it. So yeah. every generation, humanity would reset, essentially. And then we, we we developed a third place to store information. And that was writing. We learned to externalize it, right? So now all of a sudden, our virtual genome became planet-wide. It's everything everybody knows. And we started writing it down. Gutenberg comes along and puts it in these libraries. But libraries are a real problem because they're like they're like that that final scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark. They're like that warehouse. How do you if, if there's a book with an answer to some question, how are you going to find it? A card catalog, author, subject, title. If you don't know one of those three things, you might as well just wander around, right? So that cat human development. Then, then we learned a new trick. We took our 26-letter alphabet, we converted it to a two-letter alphabet, we digitized all that stuff, we put it on the internet. And we built search engines to find to search it. Now, here's the big idea. <clears throat> when you ask Google, what's the difference? How can I tell if I have a cold or the flu? Google will say, I got 30 million answers to that question. Here's the first one. Here's the second. Here's the third. There go 30 million deep. And that's because all human knowledge is still siloed. It's still in 30 million different websites. It's still scattered in 30 million different places. So Along come LLMs, and they say, let's bring all human knowledge together and have a single answer to that question. And there's one answer to that question. And what that means is that we will have developed a planetary memory, which we never had before. 
a planetary memory, one single place, this repository of everything we know, and through technology, it can lay it all and compare it all. Now, I'm wrapping up here. I'm almost done. Um, so, so, oh yeah, here's where I'm going. So, we're also putting sensors on the internet and all that stuff. And so, it, it just now, how many sensors are on the internet? Is it a, a trillion? Oh, way more than that. We don't know. So it gets all this new data. And so what it's starting to do is record cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect of everything that happens. Okay. And that cause and effect becomes a data which trains that system going forward. So that in 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, every person will be wiser. I choose that word carefully, wiser than anyone who ever lived. Because every person is going to have the accumulated life experiences of all who came before them informing their decisions, which we don't have now. People die. And it's gone. Or it's in a library and you'll never find it. So now we're bringing it up together. So I'm not bad mouthing LLMs because I think they're great databases. But they are just math. And they are, I mean, they, they're they written in, the, you know, um, Python. <laughs> uh, you can look at the code. <laughs> it is not a being. And I think it's a mistake that it represents itself. So, a so does A, when you hear AGI, do you, for I you... Think- for you, That's, part of the part of the definition of AGI is a being. Is that what you mean no, by that? No, 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 no. Uh, that, that was a tangent. An AGI okay. would be Commander Data from Star Trek, C three PO from Star Wars, her uh, ex machina. Uh, we all see them in the movies, and that's the problem because they are so plausible. Little known fact: all of those roles are played by people. They're not actually robots. <laughs> you, you wouldn't know that because they're, they're so believable. And, and so what we start doing is something called reasoning from fictional evidence. We reason from fictional evidence. And we so don't you don't think so? You don't think AGI is, uh, is, no, it's, is, is a, it's absolutely impossible. And let me tell you why. <clears throat> now you know. Okay. I, now you know. There's a lot of super. I'm not saying you're not smart. You obviously are. But there's a lot of super smart, intelligent, famous people that would disagree with you. You, you I'm sure you understand that. <laughs> I would love to see their source code. Uh, because what they have is a philosophical <laughs> belief in it, because they believe that people are machines. They be- and I asked them all that. I would say so. So, Ray, people are- so Ray Kurzweil, Elon Musk, a hundred percent think all, people all, are machines. All, all these guys, they they they, they think there's going to be AGI. You don't. No. Okay. And let me right. let me just give you. All right. I can do this in a minute and a half. All right. Okay. Go for so. It. Um, do you remember the color of your first bike or the name of your first grade teacher or something like that? Uh, how about the how about the name of my first dog? How about there you that? go. Okay. What was that? Yeah. Okay. All right. How did? Uh, how often do you think about that? Like, have you thought about it in the last few days? <laughs> no. It, okay. No. So that little miracle of you just did, like, so, there's not a location in your brain of dog names, and and your brain is like, uh, I think that's filed under D. We don't have any idea how you just pulled off that little miracle. Okay. Like, what is that memory in you? It, I don't it, know. There's not. And nobody knows. Nobody knows. So that's, that's no big deal. Maybe we'll figure that out. But that's not enough because we don't just have brains we don't understand. They give rise to minds. Now, a mind, and I, I want to be very clear. I'm not appealing to anything spiritual in this explanation. Okay. I'm, I'm, a, science, I'm a science writer. So they give rise so you don't, to that's another, that's another topic, by the way. You don't believe in higher powers or a God? No, I do. That's just not part of my argument. Okay. <laughs> no, I just, I don't think you need that. I don't think you need that. I got you. It's, I right. think it's a very simple, straightforward question. Okay. So they give rise to these things called minds. What is a mind? A mind is everything your brain can do that it doesn't seem like an organ can should be able to do. For instance, you have a sense of humor, right? But none of your cells have a sense of humor. Your heart doesn't have a sense of humor. Your stomach doesn't have a sense of humor. Um, so where does it come from? You know, if I were to ask you a hard math problem that you could maybe do, you know, without writing it down, and then I, I said, where where did it feel like you were thinking? You would say, I'm obviously thinking in my head. I can feel it. But that is a cultural feeling. That is not a biological feeling. We know this for a fact because for thousands of years, we didn't think it was the brain. The Egyptians who saved everything in a body threw the brain away because they think it thought it just cooled the blood. So they either thought it was the liver, the kidneys, the heart. That's why you learn things by heart. Feel it in your gut. All that kind of stuff. Because that's what they thought. So we don't even know if your mind, I don't think your mind is even located in your 
brain. It's distributed through your body. I mean, you have memories throughout your body. Your immune system is a form of memory. It's distributed in your body. No. So, no, okay, I'm almost done. So we have these minds. We don't understand those minds. But the minds give rise to consciousness, we think. And consciousness, man, that is, that's the experience of being you, by the way. You can put a thermometer in warm water and it will measure the water, but it will never feel warmth. You put your hand in it, you will have an experience of warmth. We not only don't know how that's possible, it is considered a scientific question we don't even know how to ask scientifically. So we have brains we don't understand that give minds rise to minds we don't understand that somehow produce consciousness, a phenomenon we can't understand. And yet, all these folks think you're going to be able to build that in a fab. And I just don't have that much faith. They're religious people. These are people with deep religious beliefs that you. we can yep. build this. And and they, they preach salvation through it. It's going to give them long life. It's going to make them immortal. They're going to they're going to upload their consciousness into it and live in perpetual <laughs> heaven. I mean, it's just a religion. And they don't have any reason to believe it's possible other than the movies and a presupposition that people are machines. Mm. But I think all of that, none of that's proven. None of that is remotely proven. Well, let me ask you this as far as your some predictions. Because you don't believe the AGS is possible. Let's move on from that. Let me ask you this. Do you, uh, there's all kinds of predictions around the percentage of jobs likely affected by AI and robotics. Let's put the two together. Let's, let's, let's put the two together. There's all kinds of articles, all kinds of predictions. Um, Can I just jump into this right here? Well, I, but let me okay. just finish Go by ahead. saying what, I, what I'm, what I'll be curious to know is I hear people saying everything's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. I hear people saying half the jobs eliminated. It could be bad news. I, I want to know where you're at in that spectrum there. Okay. Um, probably the number two question I'm always asked is that question. And, and I would say it this way. Um, I have spent a great deal of time figuring out the half-life of a job. And I think it's 250 years. I think in this country, we lose half of all the jobs every 50 years. I think it's been going on for 250 years. So you go back to 1974, probably half the jobs are gone. You know, switchboard operator, yellow page, ad salesperson, all these things, half the jobs are going. Okay. Then from 1974, you go back 50 more years, 1924. And, you know, a lot of farming jobs that were lost and all of that. And from 1924, you go back to 1874 and so forth. Every 50 years, we're losing half the jobs. Okay. And yet in this country, we maintain full employment and rising wages. Now, how do you maintain full employment and raising wages if you're constantly losing half the jobs? And the answer is simply this, is that if you went back in time, so I'll start by saying no, it is impossible for labor-saving technology to unmet eliminate jobs. Now, I use the word impossible very carefully. Why do I say that? Now, these are productivity tools and they increase human productivity. And if, if that is bad, then you should advocate for a law that requires everybody to work with one arm tied behind their back. Now, if, if you, no, don't, don't lie. If you did that, you would have just created a bunch of jobs. You need more people to do anything. But you know what? Those jobs won't pay anything because you just destroyed everybody's productivity. So what these technologies do is they give everybody a third arm. That's all they are. They increase human productivity, which is great for humans. You see, any job that a machine can do if you make a person do that job, we have a word for that. And that word is dehumanizing. Because what you say to the person is you say, well, you know, <clears throat> a machine could do this, but I don't have the machine. So I need you to be a machine. I don't need you to be a human. I want you to be a machine. Mm. And that is so soul something. Now, why do so many people worry about? And I, I used to blame the media and I don't anymore. I think I was wrong. Here's what I think. <clears throat> if you went back in time to 1994, 1995, and showed somebody back then a browser and you said in the future billions of people are going to have this what's that going to do to jobs here's what they might have said they might have said well um the stockbrokers are gone people did buy their own stock and the travel agents are gone the yellow page is gone shopping malls closing down people just buy stuff online newspapers gone people just get their news online and you know what they would have been right about everything but what none of them would have said is oh there's gonna be uber Etsy, eBay, Airbnb, Amazon, Twitter, Facebook, and all of these things. So it's trivially easy to see 
what these technologies are going to destroy, but none of us have the imagination to understand what that extra productivity is going to let us do. And so it looks like a lopsided equation. Now, the last thing I'll say on that is people are like, okay, okay, I, I, I buy that, I buy that, but there's a problem to what you're saying. And that is, there's a range of jobs in the world, and some are high pay, high skill, require lots of training, high tech, all of that. And then all the way down the line, there are low pay, low skill jobs like um, taking an order at a fast food restaurant. Okay. And what people say is they say, well, the problem with what you're saying, Byron, is technology creates new jobs up there like geneticists and it destroys jobs down here like the order taker at fast food place. And then they ask this question, do you really think that person has the skills to do that new job? In other words, can you teach a coal miner to code? And the answer is, and so they believe there's going to be this big underclass of people that, that are just, but that is never how it works. What happens is if the new job is a geneticist, then a college biology professor becomes a geneticist. Oh, but there's an opening at the college. So a high school biology teacher gets a college job. Oh, there's an opening at the high school. So now they hire that substitute teacher full time. Oh, they need another substitute teacher. And so they hire. The question isn't, can that person at the bottom do that job at the top? The question is, can everybody in this country do a job a little harder than the job they have today? If the answer to that is yes, which I think it is, that's 250 years of economic history of the United States. Technology creates jobs at the bottom, at the top, destroys jobs at the bottom, and we all ride that way up. So no, I had so many people who came on my show over five years ago and said within five years, I mean, I'm talking, I'm not even going to re read through their names, but they're all names you would know. Within five years, we're screwed. We're going to have widespread unemployment. I remember 10 years ago, it was a truck driver. Oh, they're going to automate the trucks and then the diners are going away, all that stuff. Now, in that five years, not only do we not have widespread unemployment, I can't think of one job that's been eliminated, let alone half. What's one job that's been eliminated in the last five years? Okay, now I have one. I have one challenge on this. Okay, but I, and by the way, I appreciated that that perspective. Um, really, really uh, impressive the way you you you're looking at it, and I hard to argue. My question is: Is the speed of the change the problem? I here's here's let me let me let me try to say it this way. I also believe new jobs will be created and things will eventually flush out and probably be fine. So I'm also of the belief that we'll probably be fine. I'm just worried that the speed of the change is so aggressive that there's this weird gap until it gets fine. I understand that. That's just a worry, though. There have been three times in the United States history in the last couple of hundred years where we've had radical transformative technology upset the apple cart in a major way. Three of them. Okay. So the first one was the assembly line. When the assembly line happened, if you were still building cars in your garage, that was it. You were done. Like instantly, everybody adopted that. The second time was when we went from steam uh, animal power to steam power. Now think about that for a minute. 100% of all non-human energy was derived from animals. And then within 20 years, that was gone. And it was all steam. Now, there were those teamsters. There were all those millions of people who handled all those things. That happened in a blink, 20 years. And then electricity was even faster. It, I think it happened in about seven years that we electrified industry. So we really? took all that okay. steam, oh, okay. all but, that okay. steam. I'm glad you brought that up. We threw that out and we said, okay, now it's electricity. And those are all different jobs. But you, and so, no, we, and again, well, what job have we eliminated in the last five years? I'm talking about replacing every ounce of energy in this country with a different source. We did that in 20 years. And then in seven years. Um, so no. And then I can't come up with one job that's been eliminated in five. My great fear is that people are going to be stuck doing these machine jobs that are dehumanizing, soul-sucking, because machines could do them. We just haven't built the machines yet. There is going to be such a shortage of humans you cannot imagine. That sounds like a line. That sounds like something. But when you think about everything that technology enables a person to do, if I lived in 1880 and I wanted to start a new company tomorrow, yeah, half a dozen ideas. If I live today and want to start a new company, tens of thousands of ideas. I can look at technology and imagine all these things, and they're not getting done. There's this thing called the code gap, like we need this much code and only this much has been written. We had this huge shortage of people that is not going to go away. So I'm very confident in this, by the way. This is just history. It's not like I'm so smart. This is just... 10,000 years of human history. 
that we <laughs> increase I, human productivity I'm, and that raise raises us. I'm fascinated. I didn't know the electricity switch happened that fast. Mm -hmm. 1902 to 1910, roughly, would be the range. I am in the house in the 1800s, from the 1800s, 1880s. And you can really? see right over here wow. that the hole they cut in my floor in 1907 to um, to run <laughs> electricity downstairs. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That's what we got to do. <laughs> well, well, I love your, hey, I'm, I love your optimism. I, I, I'm glad I'm I'm super glad to uh, have somebody on the show saying that, you know, we're not going to need Sarah Connor, Sarah Connor to go back in time and, and kill the, the Terminator or whatever. <laughs> it bothers me that so many people try to scare other people. Gotcha. You know, because what they do is they try to undermine their ability. They, they're like, you're not going to be able to support your family or yourself. And that thing you do, it's going to be useless and you're going to be obsolete. You're going to mm -hmm. and just the opposite. The most versatile, underutilized thing on this planet is a human. And, and we, okay, we, one we, more, we, one more, all right, one more question before you go. Uh, a, a, a similar topic, but I, I want to, how old are your kids? Uh, 18 to 25. I got, I got, I got this, I got this fly in here. It's killing me for the listeners watching me wave this flash water around. Um, yeah, I bet the earliest flash waters were a little more than just like a stick with a flat surface of the end. <laughs> um, Eight, what'd you say, 18 to 25? Mm -hmm. So the 18 year old is a senior or starting college? Senior applying to college, right? Okay, senior. All right. So are you, he or she? He, Peter. Are, are you cool with him using ChatGPT to do homework for the senior year? Yeah. I don't understand that one at all. I mean, like, like, why wouldn't you be? be like, <laughs> are you going to use it in your, in, are you going to use it in your job? Yeah. yeah. I mean, why don't, why didn't everybody have that angst about the internet? Where did you find that out? Oh, you found it on the internet. Well, yeah, I know, know, right? This is it's so, so true. I or, was, or, or, well, you're using a calculator to, to <laughs> why, why that's what I, I use the calculator one too. I, I throw the cap when anytime when a parent tells me that I'm like, do you let them use a calculator? <laughs> I don't understand it. It's like, uh, it's a tool. It increases the productivity. Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> if there's a if there's a tool that makes me more efficient and smarter and faster, I'm going to use it. <laughs> That's what tools do. That's the wonderful thing. <laughs> Increase human productivity. You know, I, my closing remark is I don't work harder than my great grandparents worked. Far from it. But yeah. I live a much more lavish life than they ever lived because an hour of my labor just yields so much more than an hour of their labor ever did. They had to yeah. walk to a well to get water. I turned a tap. And that's the world. I believe we're going to do, was it Euripides? or Anyway, that we're going to cha um, tame the savage heart of man and make gentle the life of this world. I think that the story of the human race has been there's never been enough for everybody. Not enough food, not enough education, not enough leisure, not enough medicine. So some people get it, some people don't. But then we learned a trick and that trick's technology and it's a way to amplify what we're able to do. World of abundance. You think that's going to happen? Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yep. Good. All yeah. righty. Well, thank you for having me. You Byron, shouldn't get me started. I just go on and on. Byron, and... I love it, man. Thank you so much for being on the Rider Flex podcast. I really appreciate Take it. Care. Great, great Bye -bye. stuff.